Zombie Science, Part 7. We've been going through the book Zombie Science, More Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells, which is a sequel to his 2000 book, Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. Um, the cover of the book looks like this. Um, the, to review the first chapter, which is entitled Who Let the Zombies Out? Uh, or introductory remarks, which include remarks about science, evolution, and trusting scientists. A lot about the philosophy of science there. The next uh, chapter talks about the tree of life and homology, which are two of the icons of evolution that he mentioned before that have become part of what he calls zombie science. Basically, ideas in science that should be dead but just keep living on in the textbooks because they're so persuasive until you look at them carefully. And then he talks about the other icons of evolution, the Miller-Urey apparatus, Haeckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, peppered moths, Darwin's finches, four-winged fruit flies, the horse series, and the chimp human series, um, which are all images, which is why he calls them icons. And if you think about it, when you read those things, you can see the Miller-Urey apparatus in books pictured. <coughs> the next chapter is about a new icon, with a, which is the DNA, the secret of life. And while DNA is important in life, and probably if you don't have DNA, you can't have life, a DNA is not enough to s specify an organism alone. There are other sources of information, which means changing the DNA is not adequate to get an evolutionary picture. Then uh, Walking Whales, the Whale Evolution Series has taken the place of the Horse Series. It has the problem of missing the most important intermediates, which they had the actual transition, and of not enough time. And then, uh, excuse me, um, the Human Appendix and other so-called junk where the argument over vestigial organs and junk DNA fail, both because they are not useless, including the human appendix, but also because uselessness would not prove the point the arguers are trying to make. Then there's the human eye, where Darwinists ignore the obvious good design of the human eye and the difficulty in making an eye compared with to the many times it arose according to the usual interpretation of the fossil record and even claim bad design and now are claiming that the eye can be easily uh, evolved in less than a million years. Well, if you use uh, reverse Mueller's ratchet, I suppose it could. Um, and then our, t our topic today is on antibiotic resistance and cancer. The chapter starts out, Charles Darwin did not know about antibiotics. The word was not used in the, its medical sense until the 20th century. And although people had known about cancer for centuries, Darwin did not mention it in The Origin of Species. So it's not strictly Darwinian in one sense, it's neo-Darwinian. Modern, uh, Darwin's modern followers, however, use antibiotic resistance and cancer as evidence that his theory is true. Indeed, they go further and claim that modern medicine needs evolutionary theory to deal with these problems. Thanks partly to a new field called Darwinian medicine, antibiotic resistance and cancer have become icons of evolution. Darwinian medicine. In 1991, evolutionary biologist George Williams and psychiatrist Randolph Nessie argued that, uh, pardon, announced the dawn of Darwinian medicine. They argued, interestingly, this is 1991, it's the dawn. Um, I do think medicine went back a little further than that. Um, they argued that medic medicine would advance more rapidly if medical professionals were as attuned to Darwin as they have been to Pasteur. Um, we'll see the evidence behind that claim in a little bit. 
Uh, Williams and Nessie list f listed four areas in which they believed that evolutionary theory could provide new insights into the causes of medical disorders. The four areas were infectious diseases, injuries and toxins, genetic diseases, and diseases caused by abnormal environments. The first area, infectious diseases, Will, is, will be discussed below. This, in the second area, Williams and Nessie pointed out that some bodily reactions to injuries and toxins, such as swelling and fever, can be beneficial, and they attributed such reactions to adaptive evolution. In the third area, the authors acknowledged that Darwinian theory has little to contribute to our understanding of rare single gene diseases, but they argued that common diseases of old age and aging itself may be due to genes that can be favorably selected if they also have beneficial effects early in life. Uh, in the fourth area, Williams and Nessie uh, maintained that many diseases of civilization, such as obesity and diabetes, occur because we evolved to live in Stone Age conditions, not in the environments of the modern world. But we don't need Darwinian medicine to interpret reactions such as swelling and fever. The benefits of fever, for example, were discussed and even experimentally documented before Williams and Nessie wrote their 1991 argue, uh, article with no help from evolutionary theory. In fact, um, it's interesting you could call this an evolutionary gloss. Um, the idea that aging is due to genes that are beneficial early in life is mere speculation. We don't know of any diseases where that's been either, uh, that's been documented. And we don't need evolution to recognize that an environment is harmful and devise ways to correct it. In these three areas, Darwinian medicine is nothing more than materialistic storytelling. But if you think about it, Darwinian, uh, pardon me, Darwinism itself is mostly storytelling anyway, materialistic storytelling. So. Why are we surprised? Infectious diseases. In the area of infectious disease, evolutionary biologist Paul Ewald has claimed that we can harm, harness evolution to make disease-causing bacteria less harmful. Hmm, sounds interesting. Ewald argued, uh, argues that diseases transmitted from person to person tend to be less harmful than diseases spread through food or water because the former require basically healthy people for the transmission, while the latter can spread even after killing the victim. We're going to come back to that point. Think about that and um, uh, ask yourself, is that statement really true? But <clears throat> according to Ewald, in a waterborne cholera epidemic, the disease-causing bacteria evolved to become more exploitative, using us more extensively as their food sources and thereby become more harmful to us. If we clean up the water supply, however, then we force the disease organisms to be transmitted only by routes that require healthy people. So what we should be finding if we clean up water supplies is that we drive the organisms to evolve toward, toward mildness. But we don't need evolutionary theory to know that we should clean up our water supplies. Ever since British physician John Snow discovered in the 1840s that cholera is spread by contaminated drinking water, public health officials have been preventing the disease by ensuring that our drinking water is safe. Evolution had nothing to do with it. In fact, mortality from all infectious diseases in the West began declining before Darwin due to better nutrition and public health improvements, such as clean water and better sewage disposal. The decline was also due to improved personal hygiene, as the story of Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis in illustrates. Um, I'm not reading the whole thing, of course. Um, there's some interesting stuff, but we're going to skip over it in the interest of time. Also without any help from evolutionary theory, modern immunization techniques have triumphed over two major infectious diseases, small, smallpox and polio. In the 1790s, English physician Edward Jenner started vaccinating people against smallpox, and by 1980, a global immunization campaign had eradicated smallpox throughout the world, except for a few laboratories somewhere. In 1955, American virologist Jonas Salk developed a vaccine against polio, and in 1961, Albert Sabin developed a version that could be given orally. 
As a result, polio cases worldwide have been reduced by 99%. Evolution had nothing to do with these victories. Antibiotic resistance. According to advocates of Darwinian medicine, however, there is one aspect of infectious disease that absolutely requires the application of evolutionary theory, antibiotic resistance. Microbiologists grow bacteria in shallow dishes named Petri dishes after German scientist Julius Petri that contain agar, a jelly-like substance obtained from algae. In 1928, English microbiologist Alexander Fleming was growing Staphylococcus, better known as Staph, bacteria in his laboratory when he noticed a Petri dish contaminated by mold. Remarkably, there were no staph colonies growing around the mold, suggesting that the latter was producing a substance that killed or inhibited the bacteria. The mold was a species of penicillium, another species of which is used to make blue cheese, so Fleming called the substance penicillin. Penicillin is effective against many diseases, but not against tuberculosis. In 1944, Russian-born American microbiologist Selman Waxman and his research assistant Albert Schatz announced the discovery of substance they called streptomycin. Again, I'm skipping a little bit. Uh, Ario, the next chapter or next paragraphs uh, talks about ariomycin and tetracyclines. What role did Darwinism play? Evolutionary theory contributed nothing to the discovery of antibiotics. Penicillin pioneer Ernst Chain, or maybe it's Hein, I'm not sure, uh, described Darwinian evolution as a hypothesis based on no evidence and irreconcilable with the facts. He went even further. This hypothesis willfully neglects the principle of teleological purpose, which stares the biologist in the face wherever he looks. These classical evolutionary theories are a gross oversimplification of an immensely complex and intricate mass of facts, and it amazes me that they were swallowed so uncritically and readily for, and for such a long time by so many scientists without a murmur of protest. That doesn't sound like somebody who's guided by evolutionary theory. Selman Waxman, the co-discovery of streptomycin, was more succinct, insisting simply that he saw no role for evolution in the discovery of streptomycin. In 1956, he wrote that applying Darwinian assumptions in his work was totally unjustified. Well, the people who did it say that evolution didn't really help them at all. It makes it hard to claim that evolution is necessary if you're doing antibiotic studies. In 2005, American chemist Philip Skell wrote that my own research with antibiotics during World War II received no guidance from insights provided by Darwinian evolution. Skell was curious whether his experiments was the rule or the exception, so he asked more than 70 um, eminent researchers if they would have done their work differently if they had thought Darwin's theory was wrong. Their responses were all the same, no. Now I want you to notice something about that quote. None of these people, apparently, were claiming they didn't believe in Darwin's theory. They believed in it. It's just it wouldn't matter if it weren't true. After reviewing the major biological discoveries of the 20th century, Skell concluded that Darwin's theory had provided no discernible guidance in any of them, but had been brought in afterwards as a narrative gloss. Skipping over a couple of paragraphs. Among bacteria that are normally susceptible to penicillin, a few naturally carry a complex enzyme called beta-lactamase, which inactivates the antibiotic. If a population of bacteria has a few cells containing beta-lactamase and the population is treated with penicillin, those cells can survive and multiply. The result is a population of penicillin-resistant bacteria. Beta-lactamase is much too complex to arrive, evolve from scratch by mutation and selection. Its origin is unknown. Now, even if you claim its origin is really natural selection, that statement is still true. Right now, we don't know that, other than that we know that everything happens through evolution, which is uh, assuming the uh, conclusion. 
So although the proliferation of penicillin-resistant bacteria can be described as microevolution, evolutionary theory has contributed nothing to our understanding of how such beta-lactamase originated in the first place. That statement is true even if it turns out that evolution really did produce it because it hasn't helped our understanding of it. But some cases of an antibiotic resistance are due to mutation. Streptomycin acts by binding to and inactivating the bacterial ribosome, a complex assembly of proteins and RNAs that translate messenger RNA into proteins. A mutation can alter the structure of a bacterial ribosome so that the streptomycin no longer binds to it and no longer inhibits its function, of course. Such mutations come at a price. The bacterial cells now has defective ribosomes. But if the mutation is not too damaging, the cell can still survive. When a population of bacteria containing, containing more than one, one or more cells with the appropriate mutation is exposed to streptomycin, the mutant cells can grow and reproduce. The result is a population of streptomycin-resistant bacteria. But as, they say, as he said, it's a price and if you let the wild type and the uh, resistant type grow together, the wild type overgrows the resistant type. Do we need evolutionary theory to overcome antibiotic resistance? Since the modern introduction of antibiotics, the number and kinds of antibiotic resistance bacteria have increased enormously. Will Dar Darwinian medicine save the day? The proliferation of antibiotic resistance is clearly an example of microevolution, but it is just as clearly not an example of macroevolution. Bacteria that have become resistant to antibiotics do not thereby become new species. Yet many people in the scientific establishment routinely equivocate on the word evolution, switching back and forth between microevolution and macroevolution as though they were the same thing. In some cases, the equivocation might be due to misunderstanding but in other cases, it is a deliberate attempt to mislead. Eugenie Scott, and I think those are my ellipses, I failed to color them, uh, wrote about how to deal with anti-evolutionism. Scott would introduce college students to evolution as an issue of the history of the planet, as the way we try to understand change through time. The present is different from the past. Evolution happened and there is no debate within science as to whether it happened and so on. Only afterwards, when she's got that part securely in, in view, would she bring in Darwin's big idea, which is what we want stu students to know about organic evolution. You see here a rhetorical strategy or In 2001, journalist Carl Zimmer published a book titled Evolution, The Triumph of an Idea. In it, Zimmer claimed that antibiotic resistance didn't just happen, it unfolded according to the principles of natural selection, as the bacteria with the best genes for fighting the drugs prospered. Without understanding evolution, a researcher has little hope of figuring out how to create new drugs and determine how they should be administered. Really. Is this true? Do physicians dealing with antibiotic resistance need Bar Darwin's big idea? As we saw, they didn't need it in the early days of penicillin and streptomycin, and they don't need it now. Instead, they need to focus on prevention and cure. Preventing antibiotic resistance? What works in the fight against antibiotic resistance? One uh, is identifying key mistakes in the fight and correcting them as much as possible. The two factors that contribute the most to the emergence of antibiotic resistance are the improper use of antibiotics and the failure to isolate affected patients. The indiscriminate use of antibiotics is the headline of the next paragraph, and then widespread use of antibiotics to prevent diseases in livestock, and when antibiotics are necessary, they should be used properly, finish them off, kill all the germs instead of um, 99% of them, and patients infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria should be isolated from others. Um, these preventive measures have no need for evolutionary theory. Overcoming antibiotic resistant infections. So how about curing patients already infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria? Does that require evolutionary theory? No, it does not. Some scientists have been studying the metabolic pathways in bacteria to discover new targets for antibiotics 
or ways to increase the effectiveness of existing antibiotics. Skipping over a paragraph, another approach relies on my live microbes, bacteriophages, which are viruses that attack bacteria, uh, have made uh, their debut and because of the modern rise in antibiotic resistance, there is now renewed interest in phage therapy in the West. The Iron Curtain used to have quite a bit of it. And then there are things called predatory bacteria. And uh, despite these public health and technical advances, there is still a need for new antibiotics. Happily, there is reason for optimism on this front. New antibiotics can be natural from microbes or synthetic from laboratories. Finding new natural antibiotics has a whole process behind it, and many antibiotics have been produced through semi-synthesis, the chemical modification of naturally occurring, occurring antibiotics. Such things as uh, methicillin, oxacillin, dicloxacillin coming from penicillin, um, some of the other ones that are out there. None of these approaches relied on evolutionary theory, not even microevolutionary theory. In one attempt to apply evolutionary theory to antibiotic resistance, physician Robert Woods teamed with, up with evolutionary biologist Andrew Reed in 2014 to treat a patient with an infection that was resistant to multiple antibiotics. Woods and Reed hoped that by applying evolutionary principles they would be able to help the patient. After a year of trying, however, they reported that it was impossible to make evidence-based decisions about the evolutionary risks associated with the various treatment options. Think about that. You know, the complaint has been that evolutionary theory is compatible with any evidence. Well, that means that it can't be used to predict. That means that you can't use it to predict what you should be doing. Sadly, the patient died. It remains to be seen, Woods and Reed concluded, whether evolutionary science can help with chronic bacterial infections. Another icon too good to give up. We have this evidence, but they keep going. Zombie science. So antibiotic resistance is not evidence for macroevolution, and evolutionary theory is not needed for its prevention or treatment. Yet antibiotic resistance is still being used to persuade people of Darwin's big idea. In 2016, microbiologist Bayham and his colleagues constructed a huge rectangular petri dish about two feet wide and four feet long. They called it a microbial evolution and growth arena plate, mega for short. You're going to be a wise, uh, why don't you change evolution to adaptation, which is probably more accurate, in which case you have a mega plate. But anyway, uh, they filled it with agar that contained different concentrations of antibiotics. The agar at the ends contained no antibiotics, while successful regions in between, uh, successive regions in between, contained increasing concentrations with the highest in the middle. Then they inoculated the ends with bacteria and warmed the mega, mega plate so that the bacteria could grow. As the bacteria spread toward the middle, they encountered higher and higher concentrations of antibiotics, which temporarily halted their growth until resistant strains appeared and continued spreading. After 10 days, the bacteria had reached the middle of the plate, and time-lapse photography condensed the spread into a two-minute video. After viewing the movie, science writer Ed Young wrote in The Atlantic, you're seeing evolution in action. You're watching living things facing down new challenges, dying, competing, thriving, invading, and adapting, all in a two-minute movie. Young reported that for evolutionary biologist Pamela Ye, the video also shows the importance of randomness in evolution since the bacteria causing the spread were not li always the most antibiotic resistant. They were just lucky enough to be near the leading edge where they had room to grow. But the mega plate is only a teaching aid. Depending on how it is used, it can either inform or misinform. In their report, Byam and his colleagues emphasized that the mega plate is not intended to directly stimulate Nat simulate natural or clinical settings. But its relative simplicity and ability to visualize, uh, visually demonstrate evolution makes the mega plate a useful tool for science education and outreach. Perhaps 
But unfortunately, neither the report nor the video pointed out that only microevolution was involved. The goal was not to enlighten students about the distinction between microevolution and macroevolution, but apparently to use the former to indoctrinate them in the latter. Invading education. Despite the ineffectiveness of Darwinian medicine, its advocates are ratcheting up their campaign to increase emphasis on evolution in the universities and medical schools. In 2003, Randolph Nessie and Joshua Schiffman attempted to convince national medical education leaders to institute new undergraduate prerequisites and appropriate board examination questions to ensure that medical graduates have a basic, basic understanding of evolutionary biology. I mean, they weren't doing that on their own? wonder why. In other words, Nessie and Schiffman recommended forcing students to study evolution before they could become physicians. In 2006, Nessie, along with evolutionary biologist Stephen Stearns and geneticist Gilbert Oman, recommended including questions about evolution in medical licensing examinations. Again, why weren't they doing that before? This will motivate curriculum committees to incorporate relevant basic science education, which it probably would, by the way. They also recommended ensuring evolutionary expertise in agencies that fund biomedical research. In other words, they recommended increasing the evolution content of medical education and research, not by persuading physicians and medical researchers of the practical value of Darwinian medicine, but by applying pressure from the top down through licensing and funding agencies. In 2012, biologist Ajit Varki wrote that nothing in me medicine makes sense except in the light of evolution. I wonder how me medicine ever got along before evolution came along. The, uh, same year, Nessie Stearns and Omen joined with nine other biologists in arguing that medical students should learn not only the proximate causes of diseases, such as harmful microorganisms or metabolic imbalances, but also the ultimate causes, that is, evolution. According to Nessie and his colleagues, testing competency, competency in evolution should become part of a gaining admission to medical school. The authors also encouraged evolutionary biologists to reach out to pre-medical students. Funny, the call to reach out seems more at home in religion or politics than in science. The importance of asking why. In 2005, biologists Eugene Harris and Avalyn Maliango wrote that the questions our students ask are like the endless series of why questions that children's a children ask. According to Harris and Maliango, learning the proximate causes of diseases doesn't satisfy medical students' curiosity. Maybe they should have said, shouldn't satisfy. I, having been a medical student and seen a lot of medical students learning, trust me, their curiosity is well satisfied by now. Uh, instead, the authors argued we can help answer our students' questions by providing them with evolutionary answers. And a decade later, Nessie and eight other biologists similarly argued that evolution encourages asking, investigating, and answering why questions about vulnerability to disease. Specifically, evolutionary biology gives students the tools to understand why our bodies seem so exquisitely designed, yet susceptible to innumerable, innumerable mal maladies. The next year, in 2016, medical school professors Paola Palanza and Stefano Parmigiani wrote that since evolution is the foundation for biology and biology the foundation for medicine, it follows that evolution ought to be a foundation for medicine. Instead of demonstrating these claims, they hurried on to their recommendations. Among other things, physicians should understand when and how the species of Homo sapiens developed from other species. That's really important in medicine. I guess, uh, and that the human eye has a suboptimal design. After our last session, I, one can uh, question that premise. After all, a humanistic culture is important for scientists. Oh, we want to get them to be humanists. Okay. So the push to teach more evolution in medical to medical students is justified by the desire to promote a humanistic culture and convince future physicians that the human body is not well designed. 
This is not empirical science. This is a propaganda campaign on behalf of zombie science. I'd have to agree with him there. Cancer. Darwinian medicine claims that evolution is necessary for understanding and treating not only antibiotic resistance, but also cancer. In cancer, some of the body's cells divide without stopping and then invade surrounding tissues. The result, except in blood cancer such as leukemia, is a tumor. Cancer is speciation, really. Cancer cells reproduce autonomously. Some biologists have argued that because autonomous reproduction is characteristic of biological species, the development of cancer is an example of speciation and the various types of cancer are separate species. By, in 1958, Julian Huxley wrote that once cancer has crossed the threshold of autonomy, the resultant tumor can be logically regarded as a new biological species. Who knew? In 1991, evolutionary biologists Leigh Van Valen and Virginia Majorana argued that HeLa cells, a widely used tissue culture cell derived from a cancerous tumor, should be regarded as a separate species of single-celled organisms. Physician Mark Vincent made the same point, which I won't repeat. Molecular biologist Peter Duisberg and his colleagues sounded a similar note in 2011, stating that the origin of cancer from healthy cells is a form of speciation. Skipping over, the larger question is not whether cancer cells can be considered new species, but whether cancer provides support for the grand materialistic narrative of common descent by mindless evolutionary processes. Some evolutionists say yes. Let's look at their arguments more closely. Cancer is evolution by mutation and selection. Computational biologist Joshua Swamidas does not consider cancer an example of speciation, but he regards it as a good example of evolution by mutation and natural selection. I think he may be right. This idea that cancer is an example of evolution by mutation and selection is not new. In 1976, pathologist Peter Noel attributed tumor evolution to the stepwise selection of variant sublines. Mohammed Ilyas and Ian P. M. Tomlinson and a few other authors there all make the same point, which I won't uh, bother to uh, repeat since it's a, basically the same idea. What about Swamidas's, uh, Swamidas's claim that cancer regularly innovates with proteins of novel function? Ross genes produce signaling proteins that induce cells to divide. In normal cells, Ross proteins are turned off much of the time, but when mutated, they get stuck in the on position and induce cancer cells to divide without stopping. Yet the Ross protein hasn't gained a new function, it has simply lost the ability to turn off its old one. The TP53 gene encodes a protein called P53 and so forth. Um, same idea, you lose function. In 2012, philosopher of biology Pierre-Luc Germain pointed out that the adaptations in cancer cells are not complex adaptations. In other words, they are not the result of cumulative evolution. Instead, it is the pre-existing wiring of the cell which best accounts for these features. Do we need evolutionary theory to overcome cancer? The first line of defense against cancer, like the first line of defense against antibiotic resistance, is prevention. The second line of defense is early detection. The third line of defense is treatment. If a tumor is detected early enough, it may be eliminated by surgery or localized radiation treatment. If those don't work, there's chemotherapy. As in the case of antibiotic resistance, evolutionary theory plays no role in any of this. There may be an exception, though not one that provides any real aid and comfort to the grand materialistic story. American physician Robert Gattenby and his colleagues argue that an evolution-guided treatment strategy can be effective in treating some cancers. What do they mean? Gattenby and his colleagues note that chemotherapy-resistant cancer cells, like antibiotic-resistant bacteria, tend to be less fit than non-resistant cells. When both non-resistant and resistant cancer cells are present, the former grow at the expense of the latter when chemotherapy is withdrawn. So Gattenby and his colleagues argue that the standard practice of trying to kill all the cancer cells is mistaken, and that it is better to use lower and less frequent doses 
that leave some chemotherapy susceptible cells alive. I guess so they can overgrow the chemotherapy resistant cells. Um, okay, although the tumor would still be present, it would not grow as quickly or might not grow at all. Um, I find that last line, uh, that last clause to be incredibly ignorant, but whatever. In 2009, Gattenby and his colleagues published experimental evidence that their adaptive th therapy might work. Perhaps adaptive therapy can help some cancer patients. Let's hope so. But it is, is it really based on evolutionary thinking? Microevolutionary thinking, but not macroevolutionary thinking. Darwin's big idea was all about the latter. Cancer is an icon of evolution, so the value of evolutionary theory in treating cancer is questionable at best. But some people argue that cancer is at least of value in providing evolution, uh, pardon me, evidence for evolutionary theory. Something doesn't seem right here. Darwinian evolution needs examples of biological processes that build new forms and functions. Cancer destroys those things. Saying cancer is evidence for biological evolution is like saying I have a theory that explains the rise of modern civilization and the evidence for my theory is the night of the living dead. A little uh, sarcasm there, I think. Now, my take on all of this, this is one area where I actually have arguably as much expertise as either Wells or the people he cites. Uh, I'm not only trained in medicine, I understand the basic science of medicine as well, or understood it at one time as well as anyone. Uh, board score and national boards part one, three, uh, three and a quarter standard deviations above the mean. Um, and I still understand it fairly well. I can say unequivocally that the proper study of medicine does not require belief in evolution or even understanding of evolutionary theory. Occasionally there are slip-ups in the presentation by evolution advocates. For example, you may remember that Paul Ewald argued that uh, disease Diseases transmitted from person to person tend to be less harmful than diseases spread through food or water. Um, and therefore, things like Montezuma's revenge it, are, are much worse than Ebola or Mar Marburg virus. Um, no, I don't think so. Smallpox is a person to person disease that we finally eradicated but killed many people. As I try to list diseases by person to person or foodborne, I'm not, I'm not sure I can come to the conclusion that they, can, they came to. Um, I, and I wonder how they missed that. I think they just, uh, they had this idea that it was so neat and they had a couple of examples that they could give, cholera being one of them, that, and, and flu being another one, uh, that was spread by person-to-person -person contact. Um, of course, have they forgotten about the 1918 flu epidemic? Uh, there's a lack of critical thinking about their own theory there. There are, in fact, diseases that are spread from person-to-person -person that are highly fail fatal, and there are fairly mild waterborne diseases, and therefore, I think that's just a mistake. But anyway, the idea that cancer is illustrative of evolution could be supported only in the highly artificial environment of cultured cells, sort of like the four-winged fruit fly, which can't survive on its own in the wild, and by facial cancer in Tasmanian devils. Now, facial cancer in Tasmanian devils has finally been able to become transmissible, but it's killing off the Tasmanian devil population. and therefore the substrate for the cancer itself. It's not improving the Tasmanian devil population, which it would need to in order for the cancer to survive. So this is self-limited. There is one other disease that I have been told about, and that is apparently there's a variety of uh, vaginal cancer in dogs that is spread by venereal uh, means and of course dogs are that way and so um, it's spreading in the population but again 
if it spreads to 100% of dogs, its uh, net result will probably be to kill off all dogs. If there is any evidence concerning the necessity of belief in evolution in medicine, it is, I would have to say, negative. I mean, my own experience certainly doesn't fit that. For that matter, my institution doesn't teach evolutionary theory and does reasonably well. Uh, the fact that Adventists are the longest living groups in America and one of the longest living groups in the world. Um, and Adventists um, don't find evolutionary theory, especially uh, without uh, divine intervention, as a, an attractive theory. Uh, th I suppose there are a few of them that do, but I'm not sure that those are the ones making uh, advances in longevity. We're having this argument, basically, at least in my opinion, because some people believe that all good science must be based on evolution and medicine is a science and therefore medicine must be based on evolution. And there are just too many medical doctors that are getting through that don't believe in evolution and instead believe in design. It's just not fair and so this must stop and we're going to make it stop. At least that's how I read the understanding that we really need more evolution in medicine. You know, there were enough subjects when I was going through, I understand that the, that the burden of learning all that stuff in medical school has gotten much worse. And now they want people to spend a little more time on evolution. I just, it boggles one's mind. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Uh, just a minute, we're going to get your... I just read in the LA Times, I think it was yesterday or day before, uh, that I think it was Sweden where a... Uh, huh? Okay, it's to my mouth. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I had the <laughs> instruction <clears throat> that there, uh, a, the, in the permafrost or something there was a, a young woman uh, dug up and they estimated she was back to um, maybe about four or five hundred years before Christ and she had they, they were able to find uh, live um, uh, from the plague live uh, bacteria, bacteria. yeah now how would a thing like that how would they explain that with this? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know that it has a direct bearing on this particular conversation, although it'd be interesting to know whether those plague bacteria are different from the ones we have now, and whether perhaps they were more virulent, and if that were the case, it might argue more for degeneration than it might for uh, for evolution. They claimed that this was uh, one of the plagues that had been so predominant killed a horrible amount of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and so this, um, uh, the, the astonishment, I guess, was because that particular plague had totally wiped out and then gone out, you know. So mm -hmm. then there were, I think he said, or the article said two more different plagues were similar in, in the amount uh -huh. of people they killed. Yeah. The interesting thing about that whole thing is that uh, plague is a person to person or person to rat or something like that spread disease, not a waterborne disease. So there's one more count against the assertion that waterborne diseases are more deadly than person to person spread diseases. Yes. I was listening to several dimensions of what you presented and this whole thing, quoting the evolutionists who believe it's a crucial background for doing good medicine, etc. I was looking for one term that I didn't hear and it's called experimental history, which of course is an oxymoron. Well, you can't you can't go back and repeat something that happened in the past. Right. 
But the, but the other thing is, at least from my point of view, the experiments are against the hypothesis they're pr proposing. Well, well I, I agree with that, but... Uh, you know, it, somebody the, tried experimental yeah. medicine, what happened? The patient died. Now, that's only one patient. It's anecdotal evidence, so you can't, you know, can't go from there to say it'll never work. But you'd have to say at least that it hasn't worked yet. And the idea of forcing everybody to learn this, even though you can't point to any specific, I, I mean, in, in a normal rational world, and the reason why medical schools don't teach this in, in general is precisely because most people can't find the relevance. In fact, um, one of the, I looked up one of the articles that was being used there, and it was fascinating. They did a, a survey of, as far near as I can tell, the article didn't actually say, but I think it was 121 medical schools at the time, 2003, um, in the U.S. And then they sent a letter to every dean. They got 50 responses, so we're already down below 50%. Uh, 24 of those 50, 48%, thought that evolution was important. Well, you know what that means. It means the other, 20, the other 25, uh, six or whatever it is, uh, uh, thought that it wasn't important. But they, it completely blew by these people that the majority of the medical students or the medical schools that responded thought evolution really wasn't that helpful in medicine. And yet they're trying to grab another um, four, eight, twelve, however many hours they want to teach their little specialty that hasn't been shown to make any difference in actual patient care. It's insane. But then again, they're evolutionists. But they're not just and, evolutionists. And evolution they're, claims any positive change that is true. in a group of organisms is due to evolution. That is true. And so they see a parade and run to get in the front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, narrative gloss is the, is the key yeah. phrase there, I think. But if they really got into the technicalities of evolutionary change in populations, especially some that were done a couple of decades ago, which you never hear about anymore, uh, they would shoot themselves in both feet and everywhere else. Because good evolutionary theory states that retaining individuals in the population beyond their reproductive age is uniformly negative using resources that the up and coming generation of individuals that can reproduce uh, no longer have. Yeah. And much of this, of this cancer, for example, is mostly prevalent in post-reproductive mm -hmm. humans. So you so the, are beyond your reproductive age, so we shouldn't be spending medicine on you. Well, that's exactly the point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but th would they say that and get away with it? Because that's really where the theory goes. Uh, yes, and then here. Okay. Would it be appropriate to assume that the other deans who chose uh, to totally uh, av avoid the subject were ones that were also uh, negative uh, toward including that into their medical school curriculum? Well, and that would make that uh, make it uh, so it make it about twenty five percent out of a hundred percent. Yeah, uh, I mean it's probably not fair to assume that they all were, but I kind of kind of think that if a dean were thinking, you know, you know, we really need more evolutionary theory, I think I'll spend some time on this questionnaire. Whereas, a, oh, these guys are nuts. Um, next. <laughs> You know, I agree with you. I think that the, uh, the people who didn't answer, and the interesting thing of it is, the paper didn't say how many letters they sent out. They just said they sent them out to all the deans of medical schools. And so, and then it said 50 responded. And you're left to say, well, how many, what percentage is that? 
And it wasn't until I started looking it up and actually there were 126 medical schools that, according to the, the source that I read the, during that period of time. So at, at that point you suddenly realize that their, you know, their response rate was well less than 50%. And on the basis of that, they're ready to say that every school should have an evolutionary, uh, PhD in evolutionary biology, I guess, teaching them, you know, who has no knowledge You know, internists, what? I mean, uh, you don't need that. It just, it looks like a blatant way to claim uh, uh, indoctrination time because, because Medicine is one area of science where skepticism of pure Darwinianism is rampant. Uh, because doctors take care of patients and they realize the really fine tuning of the body. It looks designed. And I think that a majority of physicians are actually believers in intelligent design. And of course, this cannot be allowed to continue. But anyway, uh, yes. I have a couple of uh, points I wanted to make. The first one, uh, four years ago, my wife and I attended a graduation <coughs> semi, uh, exercise. My daughter went to med school in, um, our daughter in Arizona. It was a beautiful, beautiful program. Ended with a beautiful prayer. And I was so well pleased. And it's a state institution. <laughs> medical school uh, so it, there is hope the problem is that zombie science holds the microphone that's the problem all over that is the problem there's a silent majority that needs to stand up and say hey this nonsense needs to stop we we talked today about antibiotics um early 18 1900s a yeah, british kid was going to school and suddenly he dropped his books and he ran to jumped in the, in the pond, saved this little kid. Well, there was a big commotion. The father, a barrister, came out and said, who is this kid? Well, um, the father came and said, it's my son. Um, what can I do for you? Um, my son has always wanted to be a physician. Ah, that's no problem. I'll send him to med school. Goes to med school. A few years later, the Prime Minister of um, England is dying of pneumonia in Egypt, Cairo. The same physician who isolated penicillin from a rotting cantaloupe uh, got that penicillin and went over to Egypt and gave this penicillin and saved the life of Jer uh, Winston Churchill. This man saved Winston Churchill's life twice. He was drowning. And he's the one who saved his life the second time. When penicillin came into existence, and you know this, they used to collect it from the urine of the patients it would be given to because it was so precious, it's so hard to isolate. And, and they would be using it again. The problem with, with this resistance is <coughs> us who write antibiotics. This doctor is no good because he did give my son antibiotic. Most of bronchitis, preaching to the choir, is viral. Most of sinusitis is viral. You're no good physician if you don't write a prescription. So, Most of so, flu is viral. Most always, you see. So we destroy the second brain, our gut, you see, and then the uh, half of our uh, dry st stool, weight of dry stool is bacteria. We kill the, wor the good bacteria and the worst bacteria take over. Problem, the blood is in our hands. You see, and uh, that's where the education needs to take place, I believe. Yeah. Be because this, the resistance. You, you need education of the general population too because uh, they expect yes. Yes. to get antibiotics yes. when they go. But, but look, 
um, uh, the best is isolation. Hey, I got a call, don't come to my house. Well, this was long time ago in the scriptures. Yeah. When you use go camp, get out of the camp to uh, and cover, you know, you, you dig a hole and then uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. relieve yourself. Uh, this is, and if you have, uh, uh, they call it leprosy, it really was uh, communicable disease, you have to be isolated. Yeah. Half of mothers going to the hospital died, the, the ones giving birth died, because the doctors were not washing their hands. So when they, the, when they came up with the right thing, okay, you wash hands, and it, it, it dropped so quickly. The mm -hmm. death rate dropped so quickly. Proves this book. Yeah. Come in here and then behind you. I'm not a medical man, but my wife Loretta worked for 10 years in the School of Medicine as one of the administrators. She was hired specifically to help uh, upgrade medical education here at Loma Linda, along with a whole team. It wasn't on her shoulders. Um, a lot of her duties involved accreditation. I was fascinated with the one point that when the accreditation team comes. They're, they're all from the state of California. It's not a national board, although they liaison with national mm -hmm. boards as well. But it's state-controlled uh, accreditation for our medical school right here. Um, they were delighted to support Loma Linda, a faith-based medical education program. Now, why? Is it because of our religion, our theology? No. It's because of our lifestyle emphasis with preventive medicine and treatment and everything that goes with it. And so yeah. they argued that as long as we're true to our philosophy of medicine and we can be evaluated on that basis, then they can put their stamp of approval on everything we do. Yeah. To me, that was just very gratifying. Well. You know, that all goes back to uh, the Bible and it goes back to that famous evolutionist Ellen White that... Uh <laughs> anyway, comment by... Uh, my comment is kind of similar to his. Uh, instead of trying to indoctrinate these medical students in this evolutionary theory that has no usefulness to their professions that they're getting into, why don't we instead increase their cor coursework for preventative nutrition. You know, like we found that uh, whole food plant-based diets, for instance, are able to reverse a lot of the common chronic illnesses and diseases. And so shouldn't we be educating these medical students in things that are very useful to their future professions uh, instead of just teaching them which drugs to prescribe, uh, instead of indoctrinating them in this, you know, evolutionary theory, right? As a good example, uh, when I had a clinical practice years ago, I had a number of patients uh, with diabetes that I put on to a very strict uh, program of a diet and exercise, and any number of them were within a year's time uh, completely able to control their diabetes uh, without any medicines whatsoever, just by diet and exercise. And same with high blood pressure. Yeah. I had patients who put on their weight, weight loss program, their diet program, and uh, they were uh, basically off of nearly all, if in, and in some cases completely off all of their blood pressure medication. So that lifestyle, you know, I had you know, explained to them, you know, here's what you do. And uh, the ones that were willing to follow it had very excellent yeah. results. And it means, too, that you don't have to worry about hypoglycemic episodes. Um, this relates to the outline that you listed, the four points that your, uh, this chapter deals with. The one that the evolutionists are least likely to deal with is environment uh, for many reasons. One is lifestyle is a human choice and endeavor. It has nothing to do with Darwinism, if I understand it correctly. You know, it's, uh, it's intelligent, guided reaction to disease. We're using our intelligence when we deal with diet and lifestyle changes. The other thing is, one reason they don't want to deal with that aspect 
it smacks of Lamarckianism that somehow environment can have an effect on genetics. And so we have um, um, a fear among medical evolutionary biologists that we might dip into Lamarckianism and take many steps backwards. So they seems like, I, I may be wrong in my analysis, but it seems like they're not wanting to deal with some of these issues that are very important in medical education. There's probably some truth to that. Hopefully a little bit. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's interesting because when I was uh, going through uh, medical school, we did a rotation through Riverside General Hospital, and there the uh, chairman of the internal medicine department was a guy by the name of Habib Bakas, who was from India and was, a, as I understand it, a practicing Hindu. And Habib would be Muslim. Pardon me? Habib Oh, he was a Muslim? That quote, the name that yeah, okay, you, you, you probably, you, you may know more than I. My understanding was that he was a Hindu, but I may be wrong on that. But in any case, he was certainly not a Christian, uh, let alone an Adventist. Uh, but he used to do the same things with his patients, basically put them on a diet, get them to exercise. And he would tell his patients that anybody that worked hard enough could get off of, uh, for type two diabetes, not type one, of course. That doesn't work, but type two, uh, which is the majority of people, um, that anybody who worked hard enough on it could come off of insulin. Now, I can still remember we had a patient once when I was at the Veterans Hospital and I was an in, a resident, and the guy was, I don't know, 600 pounds or something like that, and, uh, and he was on, uh, back then it wasn't uh, metformin, it was uh, chlorpropamide and insulin and 100 units of insulin. I mean, it was just, they were working on him and they could not get his blood sugar down. He came into the hospital, we put him on a 200 calorie diet and he actually normalized his blood sugar. 2,000 calorie? 200. 200 calories per day? Per day. <laughs> well, this is a guy who um, yeah, yeah. could spare it, it, shall we say. <laughs> Got into into ketosis, right? And, 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 and he was so grateful to have his blood sugar under control for the first time. He was fasting. He was fasting, yeah. basically, yeah. I, I just have to share this with you folks. I just came from India, and I spent three weeks there. India is replacing China now, the diabetes capital of the world. You could speed from one hamburger, cheeseburger, pizza hut to another one. I mean, it's all over Asia. In the Philippines now, it's rampant all over. And so diabetes is all over. However, this national, international tragedy is a golden opportunity as for us, the Adventists, to speak to these folk. I speak to <laughs> professionals. It's a physician's, I mean, a hall's full of. And I tell them, I'm a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist. Christians we know, who are you an Adventist? So especially the Muslim, Habib, for example, it mm -hmm. would resonate with him. He says, yeah. look, I believe in Hazrat Isa Salam coming back again, that's Jesus Christ. You all believe in that. So you are all Adventists, you see? And the Holy Quran talks about keeping the Sabbath at least in seven different places. So I keep the Sabbath. Let's go to our subject matter we're going to talk about. And you talk about Genesis 1.29. You talk about Leviticus 3.17. You can eat meat, but no fat and no blood. Uh, why not? You see? Body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So it gives us a platform to be able to speak to these folk. And they always say, please come back, speak to us again. By the way, is that not halal? That is, yes. Yes, halal, good word, yes. There is, there, is, there is so much similarity between us Adventists and Muslims, it's unbelievable. We have much more similarity than with the Protestants. 
But we don't, we just say we're scared, but we don't need to be. When they find out who we are, they love us. And they respect us. And that's our challenge. Our challenge is not to fight about pots and pans and might even say women's ordination. That's nonsense. We have a caller calling b bigger than us. And we need to be really, truly going on that part versus what we're fighting about now. Come in back there. Uh, just a snippet in terms of where this conversation has gone, and that is lifestyle medicine is now uh, just very recently its own specialty with its own board. Yes. And uh, uh, they are setting it up to have uh, a full residency in there or as a subspecialty, probably of family medicine. But it's it's taken on a real life of its own, and interestingly, the blue zones have been an important influence. Now, I understand it's heading here at, the, at this institution as a we, specialty. We, we need to explain why evolutionary uh, biology requires this. Because well, those board questions are coming up now. Well, I'm sure Loma Linda could be at the forefront of that. <laughs> Actually, it was started here. Medical medicine was started here. Last year was the first board exam that was given. Yes. I, I'm very close to this because my son is leading out in this nationally. Yeah. <laughs> and it's international now, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I just whispered to the physician sitting next to me that what is needed is to put our money where our mouth is when it comes to lifestyle. And maybe we start with Medicare and a lot of the Medicare could help prevent a lot of the old age diseases and problems that we have. If, if dollars could help support lifestyle medicine, we'd see dramatic changes down the road. Just a thought from a layman. Anyway, I wanted to, I have to go pretty soon, but I wanted to look at the overview, the philosophy of medicine, which I know almost nothing about, but the philosophy of science now is moving rapidly in the direction of Darwinism having a 100% monopoly. And you had one statement up there that really caught my eye, and that's that nothing makes sense in medicine without Darwinism. I had never heard that statement before, but it rang a bell, because we have other people in the last probably century now saying nothing in biology makes sense without Darwinism. Maybe that starts back in 1859. But then the ge geologists, of which I'm a part, have jumped on the bandwagon and they've said nothing in geology or Earth history makes sense without Darwinism. And now that philosophy has invaded the medical field. It's yeah. just a shock to me, absolute shock. Well, you know, I, I thought it was interesting because I think it's Dobshansky Dov that uh, they actually popularized that, uh, if I recall correctly, the quote came in 1937, yeah. uh, nothing in, in biology makes sense. And I, you know, I read that and I thought, oh, well, medicine is part of biology, so of course. I mean, uh, as some people would say QED. <laughs> uh, it's just... The disconnect between empirical science and what um, Wells is calling zombie science it could not be clearer. There really is no good evidence that evolutionary biology has anything to say to medicine. And yet, here are people seeing a new field that they need to control when most of them don't even know what they're talking about. You know, uh, uh, I mean, the, the idea that cancer is a good demonstration of, of evolution, 
I guess in a way it is. If evolution were left to, uh, to run riot, things would be destroyed. <laughs> That's Any evolution. Anyway, come back next week for zombie apocalypse, and then we have a few other things uh, on tap after that.